media representation coming up. And this is our last panel for the uh, conference. And um, Verena Thomas will be um, moderator for this session. Are you there, Verena? I am. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> Where are you now? You're in uh, Brisbane or somewhere, or where are you? I'm in I'm in Brisbane at the moment. Yes. Oh, okay. Wow. Take it away. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the organizers uh, for also for everything that has been said already, and um, also for um, allowing us to have this panel. And um, we've heard a lot of things, so uh, maybe some of this can be woven into understanding how the media can perhaps. Um, respond to this. So I'm very excited about this panel. We have Alison Annis, who is Communications and Projects Officer at Family and Sexual Violence Action Committee under CIMC. We have Scott Wyde, uh, who is the Deputy Regional Head of News at MTV, and also Joe Chandler, who is a Senior Lecturer at the Centre for Advancing Journalism at the University of Melbourne and also a freelance journalist. So we hope to cover different perspectives in the 35 minutes that we have. Um, and before we start, I'll just provide a little bit of an introduction to the topic and perhaps some thoughts. Um, I hope this is a bit of a conversation where I'll ask some questions to the panelists. Um, and then we see how much time we have for all follow on questions. But if there are any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so we've been as part of our Yumi Sun Up Strong project working with um, uh, community-based organizations and also the University of Kuroka have been looking at how we can bring some of the voices of the human rights defenders into the media space. So we've been looking a little bit there about at what we would might call community media. So how can stories be captured at the community level? And we're looking at today also at okay what the mass media would do, the broadcasters and the um, papers and how, how are these issues being reported on. So we're really looking at what is the role of media and, and how could we represent this issue. And um, it was in 2013 when um, the murder of Kepari Lineata was publicized um, through national and international media and, and really uh, brought attention to the issue of sorcery accusation related violence. And there we saw the kind of power of the media to bring attention to the issue and support this movement for change that also led to legislative changes um, in PNG. And over the years, I guess, we've heard different debates around the reporting of SAF. Some have called it sensationalistic in the newspaper. And, and you know, showing graphic images. And we asked the questions around what are the ethical considerations around such reporting? And perhaps sometimes in international media, we have found that, that um, PNG has been described in a certain way, perhaps as primitive, and maybe the complexities of uh, this issue that we've heard in the last couple of days are not always captured. And we're not always understanding perhaps the root causes and the inequalities that lead to such accusations. So I'm really posing the question to this panel, how can media be part of the solution? And what is the role of the media in education and encouraging positive social change? We recognize that there are many challenges for journalists and media outlets that they are facing. So we'd like to hear a little bit more about that. So perhaps I could start with Alison if you are there, and perhaps sharing a little bit of the work that you do uh, as part of the um, Family and Sexual Violence Action Committee at CIMC, um, and what the work has been around monitoring and understanding uh, how the media has presented, represented SAF from your perspective. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, first of all, yes, thank you. And do acknowledgement for the collabor collaborative effort in bringing the issue to the forefront. And thank you also for the opportunity to represent consultative implementation and monitoring council and perhaps talk about the great initiative that is being spearheaded by the organization through the Family and Sexual Violence Action Committee. 
So more so I'll be focusing on the design of the capacity building and advocacy initiatives towards contributing to media knowledge and the representation, especially of sub and other issues like family and sexual violence. Uh, um, so it is our hope that while highlighting the achievements under the media, was, we can also begin to provide answers to the questions and contribute to the new insights and begin to map a way forward. So before speaking to the questions, I'll just talk briefly around just the background on the Media Watch. So basically the Media Watch projects um, monitors print media news reports of all forms, violence, and that's including sorcery accuracies in related violence. So practically all human rights violations that are reported in the two dailies, which is national and post Korea, these are information that's readily available. So on top of this, we also monitor empowerment stories around women, youth and children. There is a media monitoring form that we use to capture all the information that we're looking for. So we're not only looking at the number of TVB or SAR, we store news coverage case by case, but also on how these stories are being reported through the print media. So if there's there are victims involved, such as women and children, human rights based and survivor centered approach is what we looking at how how this how these victims or survivors have, are represented through the media. So dignity and privacy is protected. We those are the things that we're looking for to see that dignity and privacy is protected and the safety and welfare of the victims as well. Uh, so Basically, the aim is to ensure that media frame stories in a way that is non judgmental, fair, dignified, and in a way that is deemed appropriate, based basically on the human rights framework. So, the media project is quite a huge area when you talk about monitoring print media content and one which requires full attention all on its own. So, the overall purpose is to maintain maintaining and supporting responsible ongoing dialogue and responsible reporting on F FSV, as well as SARV issues across all media platforms. Okay, now on to the this, this key, uh, sorry, there's four to keep five strategic co components or phases, I would like to say, and one of them is the TBB sensitization. That's all part of the overall Media Watch project. So, so basically the training is focused on gender-based and like I said, the sorcery acquisition related violence is a key component of this training as well. It has, it has a session on its own. And so um, I will say, basically I'm working on some of the experiences of working with the media professional in this space of the work that we do and the journalists also, um, including also editors through our sensitization programs. So, and to the question that you've asked, what uh, role that the media play in contributing to SARV? So before I get to the heart of the issue, just let me make a brief recollection uh, just perhaps to introduce where we are in terms of our partnership with the, with our, the, the program, with the media. Because you also mentioned about the trying to look at ways we can um, connect or ways we can um, sort of engage media, actively engage media in this, um, this ad, uh, addressing the issue of SARV. So Family and Sexual Violence Action Committee of the Consultative Implementation and Monitoring Council is a staunch advocate of media partnership and collaboration to addressing family and sexual violence. Basically, sorcery accusations and related violence, as well as other human rights violations in Papua New Guinea. CIMC FSB strongly believes that building or having solid partnerships with the media is an important missing aspect in our efforts towards minimizing the risks associated with the occurrence and suffering caused by physical, sexual, and psychological violence, including also the issue of sorcery accusations and related violence. So, FSB AC, through its media watch. Uh, media Watch Project and Media Advocacy Awareness Initiatives is on the strong view that if we rightfully harness media's powerful influence through its role to entertain, educate, inform, and persuade, we can begin to sensitize people on the issues of FSV or SARV and eventually start to shift their thinking, attitude, and behavior so they themselves can take uh, appropriate measures and embrace peaceful and realistic solutions towards addressing issues of violence and inequalities within their homes and communities. So our relationship with the media goes back a long way. In 2003, FSVC established the Media Watch and Monitoring um, project component to monitor the prevalence of TBB, FSV, again, uh, SARB, and other human rights violations, and track how these issues were, were or are being represented by journalists or media organizations, and further make recommendations for sensitizations of journalists on the issues. With the help of donor partners, um, CIMC was able to help 
several gender-based sensitizations and trainings with journalists over the years to ensure ongoing dialogue, gender sensitivity and ethical reporting across all media platforms, mainly on FSB and SARV. We are still engaging with the media as an important partner in our programs because media has the ability to reach masses of population around the country at any one time with information and educational and awareness messages. Uh, CAMC FSBC has Previously partnered with Media Council in hosting some of these trainings and workshops and are looking forward to reestablishing this partnership under workable terms of reference. We have been in close communication with the MCPNG executives prior to all our trainings, in particular the President Neville Choi and his executives Belinda Cora and Gregory Moses, and they have made time out of their very busy schedule to meet with us to discuss way forward in terms of how we could improve working relationship and partnership, how media can could become an active partner in our prevention and response strategies to ending violence. We had the meeting early last year, but just before COVID lockdown, and try where well, we try to identify such ways in which could work together moving forward. Okay, our relationship with the media should now position us to be able to establish strategic partnership, previously for national awareness campaigns, using media to shed light on the issues, create awareness on access to justice, support services, and also use this avenue to try positive messaging campaigns to reducing violence against women and children, in particular SARB and FSB. There are challenges within media fraternity with regards to reporting on social or sensitive issues, as highlighted, and by the journalists who have attended our GBB sensitization trainings. We will come to this later on, a little like later on. And there are also challenges working with the media, as we have found out. But all of this we have discussed, and we have tried to find a way forward. So by highlighting these challenges, we are able to identify areas of need in terms of training, media learning, so we can interact more effectively with the media on issue, issues of national importance, such as SARB. So now back to the question, what role do the media play in contributing to addressing SARB? The question is most, I feel that the question is more specific to the media, but I mean, FSB can speak on its experiences based on the collective feedback by the media, personal and key influence from SARB sensitization in media learning workshops and that we have conducted so far. So the workshops bring together media personal reporting on human rights issues such as FSV, GBB, as well as young reporters to be sensitized on the issue. It's done in order to contribute to the media understanding and knowledge on the issue of SARV and FSV and other cross cutting issues as well in order to improve represent representation of these issues in the media. So and I, as I have said late, um, while we like we believe in that vital role, by the vital role media play in shaping the public discourse as a trusted source of information, dissemination, and that it has the capacity to change perceptions and shape community attitudes. So by actively engaging media in the national response and prevention strategies towards addressing the issues and related social um, at, at the cross cuttings, it is crucial to bridging. This is crucial to bridging gender gaps. So while, but while we appreciate the active role that the media plays in creating awareness and bringing national attention to these issues, we, as organizations working in the front line of addressing violence against women and children, are also obligated to sensitize journalists on these very sensitive social and human rights issues so that they are better informed to be able to present these issues in an inclusive or a fair way. So our experience in terms of working in partnership with the media through the sensitization program is being proactive rather than being reactive. I mean, it is pointless to point a finger to the media and say, hey, look, this is not right. I think you should have reported the story this way or that way. Yes, um, not responsible to say this unless you are providing a solution as in a form of training or to sensitize them. So they are fully informed of the underlying issues and now have the risks involved to be able to represent the issues better. So the role of media from the perspective of CIMC, FSBZ Media Watch, understanding the role and influence that media plays and how to tap into that to bring about the best approaches or responses in terms of our uh, SARB awareness, advocacy to end violence. Our terms as we have found out from media monitoring daily, media does it, was it what it does best. There's no questions about that. The information dissemination, awareness raising and shedding light on the realities of the issues of GBB or SARB on the grounds. Uh, these are all complex issues, I mean, uh, it's media does excellent coverage on this in shedding light and shining a light on these issues. But these are very complex issues to report on and journalists themselves have highlighted. They have um, through, through the workshops that we uh, attended that they needed more awareness, more understanding around the issues to be able to re represent them better. So uh, what, needs to un um, what needs to happen in terms of this is because they're complex issues is to understand the ethical sensitivities and 
ethical sensitivities around these issues because um, I think that's one of the key goal um, areas that we're looking at in terms of the uh, pushing towards that goal or having a fair and inclusive uh, coverage on all issues. And see also begin to see also through our media what's how we can how how we can tailor I mean how we can use the media as a tool to bring in about um, uh, changing the way people changing the way people do you know uh, bring uh, sorry gender equality. So I mean in terms of the role that media play and if I can quote um, what former chairman the late doc, late Dr Kalino our former chairman sorry for FSVAC the late Dr Kalino said when addressing journalists during one of our workshops he spoke of the role of media and I quote, TBB is a key development challenge in Papua New Guinea, and that is evidenced by the fact that PNG has some of the highest rates of violence against women and children in the region. It is important to have a robust, informed, and independent media who are able to report fairly and freely on matters of national importance to sway the general discourse in the nation. This was evidenced in the coverage on the killing of Kepari Leniata, which brought widespread condemnation among general public and which led to the National House Crime Policy Intervention to address sorcery accusation related violence. He went on to say, and I quote, both access to justice and a free and independent media are critical enablers for a functioning democracy. Your work in reporting well-researched stories based on facts and ethical considerations will help in, in the push to decrease the high instances of GBB that we have in the country. As it is all our responsibility of all our responsibility to work towards a safe, peace, and just society for all. We, I think that is very relevant point and we couldn't agree more. So through the media, what we have identified quite a few things in terms of how media represent the stories and based also on what is it that we're looking for um, in terms of um, whether the story is has been reported in a fair and um, ethical way so on the media's part, I think more specifically, the frontline journalist, understanding the ability or the power to change mindset and perception, not just that, but having, but also having understanding also of the ethics of the responsibility that comes with reporting on sensitive issues like SARV and the other cross-cutting issues. So basically you cannot represent a social uh, a sensitive issue like SARV unless you truly understand your social and ethical responsibility as a news journalist. And I think that's one area where we have highlighted and I think from that uh, uh, suggestions also by journalists that um, you know uh, to to be to be to to be to better represent the issue is to be better informed on the issues, and we have identified issues around like reporting uh, where it's just straight news, you know, basic news reporting, uh, not really going deep into the, the the heart of the issues, and that comes back to um, the information that we have and how we can share this information with the media. So one could argue that media is more focused on informing rather than, or like I want to raising rather than persuading or going deep into the problem. And, but there are instances, instances where highlighting the realities on the ground might be also seen as being persuasive and more like provoking action. And in the case of where we see and where was highlighted in the Leniata, cases of, case of Leniata. But it is also about time that we as journalists start to ask, really ask questions that are necessary for this day and age. What am I doing with all these powers, this ability to change the world? How can I use this power and ability to change the negative discourse to reshape or change the conversations or the narrative that perpetuate violence against women? How can I really represent women and girls and children in a way that is fair, dignified and safe and meaning them no harm through my reporting? And how can I become a champion for defending rights of women and children through my work as a journalist. Okay, so these are the, when you talk about ethical questions, these are the questions that, that each journalist should be asking themselves when reporting on the issues. Um, because I, I really don't like to use the word ethics and ethical much when it comes to sensitizing or training program programs for journalists, because I think ethics in journalism, ethics and journalism go together. They always do, they go hand in and you cannot separate the true or practice one without asking what are the risks involved if I represent a particular story this way. So it would be very useful if reporters understand the ethics around the issues that we're talking about, the SARV, FSBAC, and understanding that can only help to representing it better. So what are the challenges on reporting on SARV? In our media sensitization workshop of 
on SARB or FSV in 27, 2018, media were able to have useful interaction sessions with the media participants, sorry, of FSVAC. And they gave very useful feedback with regards to challenges in reporting on SARB and other cross-cutting cross issues. One of the things we were able to do as part of the workshop about getting media to identify and talk about its challenges because we thought that um, if we could present uh, by identifying the challenges, then we can begin to understand the training needs and, and then uh, tailor the, the training in a way that will really help the journalist in reporting, representing these issues. So, sorry, I have to interrupt you here. Could you uh, just uh, finish it off in the interest of time? And you've been um, saying great things about in terms of what journalists need to do. And I want to then shift it over to Scott to ask him to respond to what you're saying, perhaps. So perhaps another 30 seconds to just wrap it up and then we go to Scott, if that's okay. Yes, Sorry okay. So that's, short. <laughs> th that's fine, that's fine. Okay, so anyway, um, just like I've said, I'll just, I'll just only highlight a few and very common ones that we came up with, not now that I've got that 30, minute, 30, 30 seconds. So one of the things that was common in the uh, challenges that were identified is accessibility to FSV and GBB and updated data and information. That were not, that, that, that generally spelled that was not readily available so they could be able to um, uh, report, you know, evidence-based, something like that. So, and then also access to reliable context um, and um, not uh, NGOs or government agencies not responding on time. And I think also with um, um, one of the key things and that to highlight it was no reporting guidelines on um, SARV or GB, FSV, the issue of GBV, and lack of awareness on that part as well, on media's part. Uh, and that goes back to sensitization programs. So having understanding around those. There are also um, <clears throat> um, some recommendations that they came up with. Yes, and understanding also of the roles and responsibilities of journalists when reporting on SBSB, they, they've highlighted a couple of those challenges and the laws and strategies and current initiatives in PNG. And one other, I think one of the key things that really stood out and I think that was really important is understanding what the goal is in terms of achieving, um, um, sorry, uh, achieving our, 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 our the aim, you know, so, uh, at the ending of SARV and other issues, cross-cutting issues. So having that um, and how media can align in terms of their reporting as well. So other recommendations were including incentives to encourage journalists to cover FSV or SARV stories. And I think there were quite a few around the terminologies, you know, how it changes all the time and all of that. Mm -hmm. So I think um, uh, laws and policies made accessible as well as community awareness. And one or two journalists have suggested like, you know, um, finding male champion within the media fraternity and training them on certain um, certain um, uh, training programs that we have. I think thank that's all. Thank you so much, Alison. This is very um, great information and I, I'm sure there's a lot of interest in this work and, and those who are uh, online, I think they would probably also appreciate having your contact and perhaps uh, a bit later uh, we can talk about how we can partner and work together um, uh, with a I, I see a lot of potential with the work that you're collecting working with researchers plus as you're already working with journalists um, working with filmmakers like Paul you know and and seeing how really we can bring attention to the issue including working with human rights defenders so um, let's move over to Scott um, so there were some challenges mentioned there. What we'd like to hear from you, Scott, is as a journalist and uh, reporting on, on various issues, human rights violations, what are your challenges? What, are, what is your perspective on how the media contributes, um, say, to positive social change? And what is your responsibility in that space? And what is your approach, perhaps? Sorry, lots of questions. <laughs> thank you, Verena. And thank you, everyone, for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I think one of the issues that we've, uh, one of the major issues that we've found whilst reporting on uh, sorcery related violence is that we're trying to deal with the one, one issue, um, one very narrow issue when we have uh, so many different uh, contributing factors to it. 
Um, uh, and I'll give you an example. In 20, 2017, we were called to the edge of the Bumbo River where a woman was about to be burnt. Um, and this was in the heart of Lay City. Uh, we ended up in that uh, settlement at the edge of Bumbo, Bumbo River. The police were there as well. They had gone there earlier uh, and rescued the woman. Now, and one of the things I found was that you know, these this accusations are happening in places where people have very limited access to education and health. Uh, this woman's husband was suffering from uh, symptoms of TB, which many people in the settlement didn't understand. He was coughing up blood. Uh, he lived in a very cramped space. Um, all the symptoms that they were describing was, uh, you know, severe TB, severe TB, advanced stages of TB. Um, and they were blaming and sorcer blaming it on sorcery. And the poor woman bore the brunt of that accusation and was singled out, brought out to the river and then stripped. And they attempted to burn her. Um, in, within the same uh, span of three months, another woman was killed uh, just upriver from where the other one was. Um, and her son, who had traveled to the Southern Islands, came back. Uh, and he was told very bluntly that the whole community killed her. And she was, she's a witch. She's a sorceress. And we, we went to the uh, bank of the Bumbo River, and they, they pulled the woman out. Um, very heartbreaking to see. You know, she, was, she, was, she was a woman in, her, I think, late 50s. Uh, mother of uh, grown-up kids uh, and and brought out there. The amazing thing was that there was a lot of kids who were witnessing all of this uh, horrendous uh, images in front of them. Um, and you talk about the secondary trauma and the you know primary trauma that's hap happening. You know people are becoming very desensitized to the violence around them. Um, and you know that we've we've done so many different stories about education and health, education and health. And this is just a classic example of the impact of that lack of education and ac access to health and education um, that's happening right, not in a rural location, in the heart of Lay City, in the heart of Lay City where people are supposed to have better access to these things. Um, so it's, uh, I guess, to long way around to your question, long way around to your question is that we have all these challenges that uh, journalists have had to deal with. We also have internal challenges in the media where you have, you train people up for several years. And I've been bothering Father Phil about this, you know, for so many years. You train people up uh, to a point where they become good at their jobs and then they leave. Uh, and then you have to, and, and I guess it's the same thing that Alison is facing, where you conduct trainings with the media council, run very good trainings, educate people, and then those very people leave for greener pastures and then you're left with a void that you have to fill again so it's it's a uh, those issues that we have to deal with within the media as well as externally and uh you know i i have a lot of praise for organizations and individuals who just tough it out without the resources uh dealing with these issues on a, on a day-to-day -day basis and I, I bother anton and uh and the mob in Inga, you know, just to get them to talk to me. Um, this brings me to the other challenge that we have in terms of access to information. Um, when there's a, you know, from the media perspective, things have to move really fast. So when there's a sorcery accusation or there's a post being made on social media, we need somebody to talk about it. You know, the evidence is already on social media. Um, respond to that video first because it brings immediate attention to that problem. If you tell us that we need to find out information first, no, it doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for the community and it doesn't work for the audience because if you immediately respond to it, uh, you know, express uh, disappointment with that video that's being aired, it immediately highlights the issue. It becomes a national issue for them for for Papua New Guinea and the region. Um, so that's, I guess, the police bit, we will come later to it, you know, we will go and get the police side of the story, but organizations were dealing directly with the uh, sorcery, uh, violence and allegations, accusations. And as soon as something comes out, 
need to respond immediately. It doesn't have to be, you know, a full statement. It doesn't have to be a full video. Just something that says that I am aware of it, I've seen it, and uh, I am going to authorities to report the matter, and then we will uh, follow up with it. Something like that. Uh, and it helps us a lot in terms of driving the issue, getting uh, the uh, getting a lot of attention on what's really, really important. Thank you, Scott. I think that's a great insight into, you know, understanding the perspective of a journalist and, and what you do when these things happen. And interestingly, social media, you know, anyone who's on site can post a video these days. And then uh, what are the statements that are coming with this video and, and how does it get verified and what are the follow on um, activities that then happen after that. Um, later, I'm interested in just briefly discussing, you know, what are the potential for partnerships? And uh, Miranda's kindly offered us a little bit more time. Thank you. Um, so we'll move over to Joe next. Um, Joe, thank you so much for joining us. From your perspective, um, you know, um, what are the opportunities perhaps for local and international media or from your perspective as a, as a freelance journalist? How do you see the issue? What, what can we do to perhaps better report on it? And how can we overcome some of the challenges that we've been discussing? Thanks, Verena. Um, and, and it's lovely to see so many familiar faces after a long time and familiar names, if I can't actually see your faces. Um, I'm, talking to you from Melbourne. So just to acknowledge that I'm living and working on unceded Wurundjeri land here um, and my uh, respects to elders past and present. Um, so the question you ask, Rena, is one that's been preoccupying me a lot. And I think it's good to say um, that I think there's some positive developments occurring in that space. Um, I, and some of them have been, um, it, I guess it's been a, a silver lining in some ways to the COVID crisis is that we have seen increasing reliance on um, and um, fabulous performance by local reporters across the Pacific on the issues um, that are occurring um, in their respective communities and nations. Um, for so many years, obviously, historically, uh, international media re rely on their old, their own resident foreign correspondents and then they fell by the wayside and then there would be the fly-in, fly-out experts, pseudo-experts, um, parachute journalists like myself, um, with, who obviously often land in the middle of some kind of crisis or event with very little understanding of the context or history or cultural constraints. Um, and can do a lot more harm than good, particularly in relation to a story as sensitive as this one. And I know in my own reporting on um, the, you know, sorcery um, accusations and related violence, I relied heavily on people like Philip Gibbs and um, various other experts on the ground. Um, and I remember I thought and interviewed for about three years before I ventured into my first sorcery related story because I had so many concerns about how to appropriately frame that for an international audience. Um, and then having worked very hard to do my best in the way that I approached it and told the story and tried to ensure that it had plenty of the context so that it would not be sensationalized, salacious, you know, sort of feed some sort of nasty international appetites for this sort of stuff. Um, only to see my report being ripped off by places like the notorious London Daily Mail who just plucked out the photographs and various elements and stripped out all the contents and got millions of hits. Um, and I spent weeks trying to get them to pull down this story, which they'd basically stolen with no authority. And they, they basically kept refusing to do it until they'd got the hits out of it. So things like that become very distressing. And I know Phil and other people that I spoke to who were my key sources and experts, including human rights defenders in various locations, in the end asked me to stop giving their contact details to international media because they were so concerned that the journalism was so poor that it was doing nothing to assist and only stirring up more problems and using their valuable time. Um, and as some people in this forum may know, and certainly they've been involved in some of the last two days, there was at least one really nasty incident where 
irresponsible international Australian reporters put a human rights defender in severe danger because of their heavy boots and poor performance on the ground. Which all brings us back to um, this question of partnership and what we're seeing increasingly now and I know I'm trying to do this in my own journalism and trying to sort of decolonize my journalism, but also to improve the quality of my reporting is to really partner up with local reporters. Um, and obviously in the past, there's been plenty of outside reporters who would engage a local journalist or as a fixer, but they, they basically use them for contacts and introductions and then were not acknowledging them in the story in lots of ways. And we're not taking on board necessarily all that those people had to offer them in terms of context for the story. Um, I think now there's um, and the model that I'm hoping we're seeing emerging and we're seeing it on the Guardian's Pacific project um, being modelled, I think, really powerfully, where you've got international, highly credentialed, very thoughtful um, editors um, providing editorial direction, money, they're paying insurance and support, but partnering with local journalists and both their bylines are on the story um, and all of that context comes into the story. Um, so that Pacific Guardian model, I think, is showing us where we can go with this kind of reporting. And, and you look at the calibre of reporting we've seen there over the last two years um, and it's you know, it's been truly illuminating to see. Um, I don't know whether you've seen this at the moment, there's this Pacific plunder project that they've got rolling on a whole range of, you know, mining and fisheries issues, which is just, um, and mostly all locally reported and then report um, written in partnership with, with um, international editors. So that point that Scott was just making about losing the best reporters more of this model of reporting will assist in keeping them because they will see a trajectory where they get international recognition, where they get properly paid. Um, and I know when I've spoken to Scott in the past, you know, just finding insurance to go to a lot of the locations, you know, journalists in, in Papua New Guinea um, find it very difficult to go on location to report complex deep stories like this because of Obviously, there's dangers attached to it and they can't get the coverage of insurance they, if they get sick or if they get injured in the process of that, um, who's going to look after them while they recover? The, if they don't have a supportive newsroom with the resources to back them up. Um, so I think this model we're seeing where the increasing international reliance on the local reporter supported by the international masthead and editorial team um, has to be a win-win for... Um, for the issues at stake and for the local journalism scene. Oh, I'm sorry. Very sorry. I thought I'd turn that off. Um, so I guess that's the, the thing that I find very exciting and which I hope um, uh, that, that, you know, we'll see a lot of improvements. Um, the only other thing I quickly say is that obviously for international, but outside of reporters flying in and out, um, you know, it, if you don't take the time to do the deep research and who don't locate appropriately credentialed and experienced and relevant experts, they are particularly an issue as sensitive as this one. Um, they are very likely to do a lot more harm than good. So I think providing um, maybe there ought to be, you know, some sort of effort to alert them maybe a bit more. I mean, certainly they should be smart enough to figure this out themselves, but um, there are plenty of reporters who get dropped into a location because there's been a sort of sensational development and for lack of kind of uh, go-to resources. Um, so I think the sort of thing that we've heard Alison talk about um, to be making sure there are some, you know, education materials and protocols that are specifically targeted to international reporters to alert them to the kind of problems that they might cause if they don't go carefully and just some background resources could be really really useful. Um, I, if anybody's got any other specific, um, I guess the other thing I think I'd observe now, like in reporting, reflecting on my own reporting um, and what I do differently now, um, we're certainly seeing a very substantial shift to constructive journalism models where we look at solutions and we look at um, uh, actors, local actors and what they're doing. And I look back at some of the reporting I've done and I think, you know, I could have flipped that on its head rather than coming in from um, the angle of a particularly um, explicit incident. And obviously it is newsworthy and that's why I'm reporting it. But 
for example, the work of human rights defenders, um, locally initiated, you know, courageous, heroic individuals doing, um, you know, you're respecting their agency, you're respecting their, um, you know, the local capacity to act and recognising that. And that is also a really um, engaging way into the story that rather than glorifying the kind of salacious, violent aspects of it, and, and whilst we don't want to gloss over any of that, it's important, you know, this is an alternative way into the story that could be a lot as galvanising and as interesting to international and national audiences, but also be highlighting what can we do about this and what are the resources that could be brought to this space? Because why are you telling international these, um, um, audiences about this unless you're wanting them to think about their investments, their government, where their government aids are go, is going, where their superannuation and investments are going, and the kind of actions they want um, to, the, you know, a, you know um, agencies they're involved with to be pursuing on the landscape. So, I think highlighting the work of human rights defenders and other local actors is is an angle that we should be, you know, obviously pursuing much more closely. Thank you so much, Joe. Um... And thank you, all the others. I know we've run out of time. I, I could keep going for a very long time because I find it a fascinating discussion. Um, but uh, a couple of things I think to highlight. One is that uh, joint resources, I know the resources have been shared and Alison mentioned, you know, the training that you do with journalists. And, you know, we have many people here in our virtual room that are producing resources that are doing work. So how can we partner and work together? you know, that, that we can contribute to um, CIMCs or who has ever platform, but really sharing those resources and making them available to national and international journalists. And one other thing, I think a key thing is risk and the ethics of representation and really anyone who's coming uh, externally or is new to journalism, really understanding potential risks that they can put people in when they're reporting on these issues and how can we all, um, you know, create perhaps resources and information to for people to understand what those risks are. And parts of it has been also, I think, working together with uh, human rights defenders and community-based organizations is also to look at what are organizational media policies and how can they also request from journalists to perhaps see um, things they're writing up before they go out so they can also have a feedback loop and correct in case or making sure that the names that are mentioned are okay that people are safe and all of that so there, there's many things i think to consider and I, I i'm sure that many in in our zoom chat would have a lot to say about this but we've run out of time thank you very much um, to the panel and i hope we can continue this work in the partnership so back to our chair.